use as a test bed for I this uh, concept. And then after showing this system, we uh, using this to test the uh, vanadium-4, vanadium-5 redox couple. Right. And after that, we'll plan to do the vanadium-2 and vanadium-3 redox. And then mm -hmm. we can demonstrate this in an all vanadium system. And I the see. reason we picked the all vanadium system is because it's the uh, system is, is um, most widely commercialized. Right, right. And then we'll take this concept and apply it to other redox chemistry too. I see, I see, terrific. Hello, Adam. Hello. Hi, Professor. Oh, hello, how are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you. So me. Great. It's been a long time since we've seen each other in person, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I've been following these conferences. It's a, it's a really neat concept. Thank you for the uh, great questions uh, yesterday. <laughs> they were a little bit too long. I'll try to keep my questions shorter today. <laughs> okay. Hello, Christopher. Hi, Shru. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I think I've downloaded more new papers in the last day and a half than the previous rest of the summer. It's some really interesting talks. So, <laughs> so great job of pulling together this, uh, this group of people. It's really broad, so it's, uh, it's been very really useful. Glad you like you. Yeah, because we uh, have become so specialized, right? So we live in our own cocoon. So it's good to know what's going on in the other areas. Yeah. So it was interesting to hear about the nuclear part, pump hydro and all that. And the big picture too, from the uh, um, plenary speakers. Great. Yeah, the program has been uh, very exciting to me <laughs> so far. I learned a lot uh, just listening to these discussions and talks. Well, it's exciting to hear some of, some of the um, uh, more advanced applications. We have a, a, a Professor here who's been working on um, uh, the um, uh, photochemical hydrogen. And um, since I last talked with him about it just two, two and a half years ago, and he, he moved to a different area, the, uh, the efficiencies have gone up quite a bit, even in that short time. It's, it's neat, neat to hear. I assume the ultimate solution will be a combination of many solutions. Right, right. Makes sense. It's like um, my own field, field is uh, chemical metallurgy and people keep asking uh, which is going to win between the, the hydrogen direct reduced iron or the um, uh, molten oxide electrolysis uh, from, from Sadaway's group, MIT. I think there are some good applications for both of them and, and it's not clear there will be one winner. So <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, so. Interesting. Yeah, I've been learning more about um, steel making. Like people have talked about oh, hydrogen be used for steel as a reducing agent, you know, substitute for CO. And that's all I knew. But then I've started reading more and I'm like, man, steel making is a crazy process. Uh, just all the different temperature gradients, like in a blast furnace, I mean, and yeah. scrap metal use. And I thought it was a lot simpler, uh, but iron, I, I know iron chemistry is crazy. Like people looked at like iron redox flow batteries and it's just one of those things to really hard to control, like the oxidation states that you want and so forth. So that's um, well, it's amazing that and blast furnace has been um, around for so long and people have modeled it, but the only imaging of the inside that I've ever heard about was a Nippon steel study where they were actually able to um, map the, um, uh, the um, uh, cosmic 
particles, high energy particles oh, coming really? from a blast furnace. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> wow. wow. the wow. inside of a blast furnace. It's, it's so hot and so uh, impenetrable. <laughs> wow. So. So we'll see. That's uh, you know seven percent of the emissions. So try to try to do our part. And <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's one of those um, part of the manufacturing sectors that's really hard to decarbonize, like steel and cement. I mean, if you just look at the the chemistry and the stoichiometry of it, uh, it's it's challenging. So. And it's exciting. Uh, the, it looks like hydrogen is working. So, of course, for you know, uh, more cost for green hydrogen than than for uh, for natural gas for direct reduced iron. It's a pilot plant, and um, uh, there's just been an announcement of a of a large plant in uh, in Spain. So, we'll have to see. And Volvo is looking at using uh, the output for its uh, its vehicles. So, just see if there's significant uh, significant differences in properties. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Yeah, I mean, that's the DOE goal now. Like, it's one of the earth shots is to bring down green hydrogen costs to a dollar per kilogram, which is like an 80% reduction in costs. Um, that's pretty challenging, but, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're here for. So great. Great. So we have a 110 start time, right? It's a, just a few seconds. Yeah, I guess. yeah. yeah let's, okay. let's get started. Okay, I'd be glad to. Well, terrific. Uh, well, welcome to this uh, session on, on decarbonization, uh, Then um, uh, We have three really interesting talks uh, by uh, uh, Trung Nguyen, um, uh, uh, Christopher Argus, and uh, Xu Hu. Uh, and uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, Trung Nguyen. He's a uh, professor of uh, chemical and petroleum engineering at the U University of Kansas. Uh, he did his uh, bachelor's degree at uh, North Carolina State University and master's and PhD at Texas A&M, all in chemical engineering. Uh, before the University of Kansas, he was a member of the technical staff of Bell Labs and associate director of uh, uh, Center for Electrochemical Engineering at Texas A&M, uh, senior product and process development engineer at Duracell, and a postdoc at uh, Los Alamos uh, National Lab. So he's had uh, uh, experience from uh, uh, academia, industry, and uh, and government labs uh, quite a bit uh, understands a broad range of, of uh, different um, uh, you know, development environments. He'll be talking today about a, a solid liquid high energy density uh, storage concept for uh, redox flow batteries and its demonstration in a hydrogen vanadium system. So uh, look forward to interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, the talk today uh, is about a new approach to try to resolve one of the issues related to uh, the shortcomings of the redox flow batteries. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the co-author of this work, and that's the Dr. Yuan Chao Li. He's a postdoc in my group. The presentation is outlined as follows. So I will give you some background information and the motivation for this work. And I'll talk about this new solid liquid storage uh, concept. And in addition to that, I'll talk about the uh, temperature swing method uh, is needed to enable this uh, solid liquid storage concept and the operational requirements and discoveries that we found uh, during this study mainly the uh, uh, precipitation and the dissolution processes and the uh, precipitate structure and the nucleation materials uh, needed to provide this uh, fast dissolution and precipitation rates needed to enable this concept. And then the demonstration of this concept in a vanadium <laughs> system. And then I'll end with the summary and future work in this area and uh, acknowledgement of the financial support of this work. Well, this is probably all information for most of you now. Electricity is uh, 
from wind is shown to be economically competitive with that of carbon-based uh, sources. And solar is also becoming competitive in some geographical locations and markets. Uh, deployment uh, beyond 20% of these uh, benign energy sources is either not possible or attractive unless some economical electrical energy storage solutions are available, mainly because the uh, electrical distribution system cannot handle uh, fluctuation of this scale, right? You can't just lose 20% of your electricity from these sources from one second or one minute to another. Then to, a, uh, to the owners, the access capacity that they have during a low demand uh, is not utilized. So it doesn't bring economic benefits to them. So by having some kind of storage technology, you make it more attractive to them. Now, if you want to go beyond 50%, uh, wind and solar have to become uh, what we call reliable sources. Right? That means just they have to become something like what coal, natural uh, gas uh, power plants or nuclear are right now. Because if you cannot suddenly lose 50% at that scale. Because you don't have the remaining sources to back up to provide uh, uh, for the loss. So, uh, just having enough storage uh, capacity to handle the daily variability is now no longer enough when you go up to this scale. You need sufficient uh, storage capacity to handle the long-term availability. Like let's say you don't have solar or wind for days. Right? So, and we have discussion about going to 100% electricity from renewable sources. At that scale, and these uh, intermittent uh, but uh, benign sources have to become reliable. Just like a coal power plant when they store at least five day supply on site. So a little bit more background information. The redox flow batteries uh, consists of a power generation unit uh, shown here that is separated from the external storage tanks and offer flexible power and energy design and are highly suitable for this uh, large scale energy storage application. Another point to highlight is that this uh, separate configuration makes recycling easier at its end of life too. Right? You just have to recycle the electrolyte. And for the uh, generation unit, you don't have a mixture of a bunch of different elements that you have to worry uh, about. The electrical energy, for excess electrical energy from wind and solar sources is stored in these redox flow batteries in some aqueous or non-aqueous soluble ions uh, in the electrolyte solution. Uh, because of the so low solubility of the most ionic materials in aqueous and non-aqueous solvents, uh, these redox flow batteries have low energy density. Uh, we're talking about uh, solubility in the range of one to two molar uh, for most system. For example, uh, the energy density of the all vanadium redox flow battery, which is uh, widely commercialized now, is about 20 watt hour per kilogram. And if you compare that to the lithium ion batteries, which average about 200 watt hour per kilogram. So to store a lot of energy, uh, what required you can see a large uh, volume of electrolyte, a large number of storage tanks and a lot of floor space. Uh, the cost of these storage tanks and floor space are major issues for the redox flow battery users. As an example, a four hour all vanadium redox flow battery, the electrolyte storage tanks constitute greater than 50% of the total storage space as you can see. And this is a really small system that I have in the photo here. If you talk about 100 megawatt size, it's huge, okay, it's just gigantic. And the cost of the storage system is more than 10% of the system cost. So scaling uh, this up to like for, uh, for five days, as you can see, would require scaling the storage unit uh, significantly.
So the, as you can see, the impact of the five-day storage requirements uh, is tremendous, but it can be addressed if we can in, somehow increase the energy uh, density of this uh, redox flow battery system. So with that, uh, I introduced this new solid liquid uh, technology. Uh, by using this new technology, we can increase the energy density by a factor of four to eight uh, overnight. Right? So with the, the, with the existing storage facility, we can implement this uh, four to eight time increase. So if you take a, an existing four hour redox flow battery storage system, by implementing this system, overnight it can become a 16 to 32 hour system, which is quite attractive. Or you can maintain a, a four hour system, but with uh, a lower cost and smaller footprint. So this uh, technology will uh, make the uh, expansion to long duration uh, or day uh, length duration uh, more feasible. All right, a little bit information about this uh, solid liquid storage concept. Uh, the, the solid uh, liquid storage concept increases the amount of active ions that you can store in a given uh, volume of the tank. Why do you uh, maintain the uh, flow battery concept? Right? The high energy density is achieved by storing the active materials in a mixture of uh, liquid and additional amount in its uh, undissolved solid form. Right? The ratio of these two phases will determine its final effective energy storage density. For example, the commercial in the a commercialized all vanadium uh, redox flow battery system. The uh, vanadium sulfate at the positive uh, electrode uh, is stored at about 1.5 molar, which is about 40 amp hour per liter. If you store this in its uh, hydrated form, it has an equivalent concentration of 8.25 molar or about 221 amp hour per liter. And just by a two to one solid liquid mixture combination, you can increase the capacity to 163 amp hour per liter or a four fold increase. The flow battery concept is maintained by circulating only the liquid phase to the battery, right? So the solid remains inside the storage tank. And with this approach, you can eliminate the uh, issues that people have found with uh, a uh, similar approach in the past, that is the, uh, the shorting uh, issue when you circulate the solid liquid slurry, which are typically conductive with, uh, to the stack and you have shorting between the cells. And you also have very high pressure drop or poor fluid distribution when you try to circulate uh, these high density slurries. Another advantage here is that until the solid is completely consumed, the ions in the, in the liquid is always at the saturated concentration, right? So having that constant concentration, instead of decreasing concentration during discharge and charge will give you a higher voltage or a longer high voltage over long duration. That will mean higher energy output is another advantage of this method. Right, so I need to ex uh, explain a little bit why we need the uh, temperature swing method. So when you operate with this solid liquid uh, concept, you're starting out with a, uh, a mixture of excess reactant, right? The reactant is in a soluble form as well as in a solid form. So during charge, eventually the product will become saturated, oversaturated, and it will precipitate out. And you don't want that to precipitate out and you have to come up with a way to avoid that. And to the, do that, we developed this uh, temperature swing method. The key features of this uh, method are as uh, follows, right? The, the battery operates at a uh, higher temperature, let's call it TH. 
when they're the reactant or the active materials are stored in the electrolyte at a lower temperature TL. Okay. Uh, the low solubility saturated solution at TL is then heated to the battery at TH. Once you heat it up to TH, you raise the solubility. Right? The concentration remains the same, but it's below saturation. So it allows you to generate more in the battery before you reach saturation. Right? And then you, when you, the effluent then is uh, cool down and send it to the uh, storage tank, at a, at a lower temperature, it becomes supersaturated and it will precipitate out. Right? So this allows you to have a feed uh, concentration that's always below the saturated concentration at the battery operating temperature. For example, the solubility of the vanadium uh, 4 sulfate at 20 degrees Celsius and 45 degrees Celsius are 1.8 molar and 2.7 molar. Uh, respectively. So this gives you a 0 0.9 concentration, 0 0.9 molar concentration difference per pass to the battery to operate, right? So let's say you come in at 1.8 molar, right? Once you heat it up to 45, its solubility is 2.7. So you can charge it all the way from 1.8 to 2.7. And you take the effluent out at 2.7, you send it to the storage tank where you precipitate it out. And then you, the, the liquid that you send back to the battery is again at 1.8. Okay. So this temperature swing method allows you to use this solid liquid storage concept. Right, to, to demonstrate this, uh, I select the uh, vanadium-4 sulfate uh, electrolyte at the positive electrode of the all vanadium redox flow battery. Uh, to, to, as I mentioned earlier to the uh, moderator, we selected the vanadium system because it's uh, uh, widely commercialized. So let's say doing uh, charge, uh, the uh, saturated uh, uh, vanadium four uh, solution is pumped to the heat exchanger and is heated to TH before reaching the battery. Uh, in the battery, vanadium 4 plus is consumed uh, to uh, make vanadium 5 plus, right? so it's oxidized to vanadium 5 plus. If this effluent uh, leaving the battery is then cooled to uh, the lower temperature TL and returned to the storage tank. As vanadium 4 plus is consumed, we expect its concentration to drop. But once its concentration drops below its saturation level, the solid vanadium 4 plus would dissolve in the storage tank to maintain a constant a concentration of vanadium 4 plus. This continues until all the solid vanadium 4 plus is completely consumed. Right? After this, the battery will start to consume the soluble vanadium 4 plus in the liquid uh, solution. At the same time, vanadium 5 plus is generated, so its concentration will increase. Right. It will reach saturation, for example, at 45 degrees in the battery. When you send it to the storage tank and cool it down to, let's say, 20 degrees Celsius, its concentration becomes oversaturated and it will precipitate out in the storage tank. So steps two and five can continue until the charging process is completed. And the whole process is reversed during uh, discharge. Uh, for this uh, process to be successful in uh, this application, we found that there are some crucial operational requirements. The most important thing is the rate of precipitation and dissolution must be high enough, must be really, really fast to reduce or increase the concentration of the active ions in the storage tank at the lower temperature TL to allow you to exploit that full concentration difference window, right? Between let's say 1.8 and 2.5, for example. And we found that to promote faster precipitation and dissolution, uh, we have to use some kind of nucleation material. So we explore uh, some nucleation materials as shown in the table here. 
uh, we looked at activated carbon fell, we looked at zeolite, and we found that if you don't have a nucleation site as shown in the table, the precipitation rate can be as long as 10 days uh, if the oversaturation level is uh, low, like 0 0.6 molar. But with activated material, you can cut down the precipitation rates down to anywhere between the 45 minutes to 90 minutes. That is a lot faster, but it's still not fast enough for this application. However, we found that if we took the precipitate that were generated by these activated uh, nucleation materials and use this precipitate as the nucleation material itself, the precipitation rate decreases significantly down to within five minutes. And this is with uh, Anster uh, solution and with only about 10% uh, solid to liquid. Right? So you can vision if you go to higher solid to liquid ratio, you have a lot more surface area for precipitation and that precipitation rate will be uh, cut down significantly. And the, another point we found that uh, since you require some oversaturation threshold to have precipitation, you can also take advantage of that uh, additional uh, concentration difference, uh, oversaturation concentration difference as your full uh, concentration swing window to allow you to charge or discharge the battery at a higher current density to give you uh, more uh, higher power output. That means you don't have to uh, control the current density to charge the electrolyte up to only its saturation level at the higher temperature. You can go beyond that. You can go into the oversaturation uh, concentration. To understand the uh, precipitation and dissolution processes and mechanism, uh, we looked at the uh, structure of uh, all vanadium sulfate uh, uh, solid. And we did some DFT calculation as well uh, to identify uh, why certain structure provides faster precipitation and dissolution and so on, right? So what I'm showing here uh, will help explain that. Let's start with the solid number one. This is a com the commercial material that, that you buy from uh, a supplier. When you dissolve this material, it creates two structure. It creates a number two structure, which includes the undissociated ionic clusters, where the sulfate and ion is ionically bonded, the vanadium four cation. And then it creates also what we call the dissociated structure, where the vanadium four plus cation is now bonded with the water molecules and this sulfate and iron is, exists only in the second hydration shell. So it's bonded to the cation uh, more weakly. Right? So it can be uh, broken quite easily. And it's uh, this dissociated uh, vanadium four cation in the structure number three is the electrochemically active cation not the one in number two. Now, if you look at the precipitation process, during precipitation, structure number two can precipitate out to form the original commercial number one structure. Structure number three can uh, precipitate out through the same route, first to number two and all the way to number one to uh, uh, form the original structure. But it also precipitates into two new structure involving the dissociated ions. Right? So where the cations and the anions are weakly bonded, it can form number four where the structure is more amorphous, not crystalline, and number five where it's more crystalline. So now if you need to dissolve this, you can see that uh, structure number four can dissolve really, really quickly because the uh, cations and anions are not uh, strongly bonded.
to support the mechanism study, we did uh, some extra uh, measurement uh, to of the precipitates. So this slide show the XRD results for uh, four different uh, solids. First, the S received uh, vanadium sulfate shown in black. Okay. What you should have seen here is that the, that uh, gel-like uh, non-crystalline, a low crystallinity vanadium sulfate that has very high precipitation rate. If you store it long enough, like six months, it forms a structure that is very similar to the SVC one. So what it's telling you is the, the structure in the SVC material is the structure that is most thermodynamically stable. Right? Anything, if you let it sit long enough, will be determined by thermodynamics. So that structure is the most stable one. The, uh, the gel-like structure, the one that has high precipitation and dissolution where it has a different uh, XRD structure with lower crystallinity. And then when you store it for one month, uh, it still maintain that same structure. So it tells you that one month storage uh, doesn't uh, alter the uh, structure of this uh, high dissolution precipitation uh, solid. And that's a, a suitable structure uh, for this application. So the results uh, shown earlier uh, show to us that we have two different solid structure for the precipitate. A highly crystalline structure uh, consisting of undissociated ionic clusters and the less crystalline gel-like structure consisting of dissociated ionic clusters. Okay. And so we hypothesize that the uh, this structure that involves the dissociated ionic cluster should be the structure that we want to go after because it has higher dissolution and precipitation rate. And uh, it has, should have more of the electrochemically active vanadium four plus cation. To validate this hypothesis, we conducted an electrochemical study uh, which consists of measuring the uh, uh, polarization, oxidation polarization curve for three different uh, cases uh, that have the same amount of uh, vanadium-4 solid, but different type of solid. And then also measure the open uh, circuit potential. Right? The open circuit potential or equilibrium potential of a solution with a concentration where the concentration of vanadium-5 plus is fix. We added a small amount of vanadium 5 plus to fix that concentration. And then in these uh, three different solution, uh, depending on the amount of active vanadium 4 plus in the solution, you should have a different open circuit potential or equilibrium potential. So if the concentration of the active vanadium 4 plus cation solution is higher, the NERC equation tells you that equilibrium potential should be lower and vice versa. On the polarization curve, the slope of the curve gives us the uh, electrochemical activity of the solution. So the higher the concentration of the active the vanadium four plus cation, and the uh, higher the slope will tell us that uh, we do have uh, more of the vanadium four plus cation that is in uh, dissociated form. The results, uh, show here, as you can see, that this blue case, okay, that's the case of the, uh, that contains the uh, gel-like low crystallinity vanadium sulfate, right? It has a, the lowest uh, open circuit potential. So that means the concentration of this active vanadium four plus is higher. Not only that, it has a higher slope, right? So that uh, confirms the hypothesis uh, that uh, that's the structure that we want for this application. Great, right. so after we have identified the suitable precipitate form and determined that the precipitation rate and dissolution rate are fast enough for uh, this application, 
They wanted to confirm this right, in an actual system. And we selected the hydrogen vanadium system because we can concentrate on one vanadium redox chemistry only, uh, the one on the positive side. And on, a, on the negative side is the hydrogen uh, redox reaction. So the system consists of a 16 centimeter square flow battery, uh, a, a vanadium storage tank, a heating section, and a cooling section uh, for the temperature swing method uh, on the vanadium side. On the hydrogen side, we have a hydrogen flow through uh, setup where we purge the hydrogen and we don't worry about storing hydrogen in this study. The storage tank consists of two compartments. This is a key feature here. Uh, you have the liquid sitting on top. The bottom, you have the solid. This is the nucleation material solid, which is also the solid form of the active material. And they separated by a porous uh, separator. So we do this uh, temperature swing this way. The battery operated at 40 degrees Celsius. This uh, storage tank, the electrolyte storage tank operates at 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, for the simple lab setup in the lab, we use cooling water uh, to do that. But in the actual system, which were envisioned using a two-way heat exchanger, right? the heat that you cool the battery to the storage tank should be used to preheat the electrolyte and so on. Uh, okay, the results. All right, so the demonstration was conducted as follows. Uh, first, we uh, conducted a charge and discharge cycle using only uh, a, a full liquid uh, uh, storage system. It has about 1.8 molar vanadium sulfate in three molar sulfuric acid. Uh, without solid. And we discharge and charge at 100 milliamp per centimeter square. And uh, with the uh, 1.3 volt and 0.5 volt as the cutoff voltages for charge and discharge. And the temperature swing range was between 40 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius. After we did that uh, one full cycle uh, without a solid, then we added the solid, uh, the uh, gel line low crystallinity uh, solid that we created from uh, another experiment right, to the uh, storage tank. And then we repeated another charge and discharge cycle. And the results are shown here. The, uh, the solid curves are for the case uh, uh, without the additional solid. And the dash curves are for that with the additional solid. First, uh, you should notice that uh, the capacity is increased when you add in the solid, which makes sense. And the uh, specific energy uh, system uh, or the system also increases because you add more active material into it, even though you add it in a solid form. Another interesting, as we highlighted earlier, is that with the solid in the system, you would expect the active uh, material concentration to remain constant the whole time until the solids completely consumed. And if the concentration of the active material is constant, then you should get the same uh, voltage or constant current. And that is shown by the steady voltage plateau, right? And near the, uh, the onset of charge and discharge is shown here. So it helps to stabilize the voltage output of the system because the concentration remains constant that whole time. The voltage plateau is shorter uh, in the discharge, showing that the solubility of the vanadium 5 plus may be higher than that of vanadium 4 plus. That means we have less, for the same amount of solid vanadium 4 plus we added the system, we then end up with a smaller amount of vanadium 5 plus in the system. In summary, the uh, solid uh, liquid storage concept and the temperature swing method allow the storage energy density of a redox flow battery to be increased uh, significantly. The, the controlling factor is the rate of uh, 
precipitation and dissolution of the solid phase of the active materials. The rate of precipitation and dissolution is highly influenced by the structure of the precipitates or, or they also serve as the nucleation uh, centers. Uh, we found that the meta stable low crystallinity, crystallinity structure of dissociated cation and anion clusters gives the highest precipitation and dissolution rate uh, and electrochemical activity. Uh, demonstration of this concept in the hydrogen vanadium system shows that the precipitation and dissolution rates are high enough right, to stabilize the concentration of the active ion in the solution when the solid phase is still present, giving rise to uh, higher system voltage and uh, energy output. And this is an additional benefit uh, of this solid liquid storage concept. As far as future work is concerned, we want to, we can well uh, work on this uh, hydrogen vanadium system, uh, playing with higher solid contents. that we demonstrated with only 10% solid, we want to go to as high as two to one over different temperature windows, and more cycles. And we will use the in situ OCV measurement to monitor the concentration of vanadium four plus and five plus in a storage tank as a way to measure the dissolution and this precipitation rates of vanadium four. And then we'll do it for vanadium five. And then we'll extend the concept of vanadium two and vanadium three couple so that we can demonstrate this concept in an all vanadium redox flow battery system. Once we've done with that, or maybe we have more human power available, we'll uh, extend this concept to other redox chemistry and system. Uh, one of the chemistry we're interested in right now is the titanium iron uh, redox system. With that, I will end by acknowledging the financial support of the National Science Foundation through grant number CBET 2024378. And I thank you for your attention. Terrific, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Nguyen. Uh, Nguyen. Uh, so this is a very interesting talk. Uh, so uh, please um, uh, feel free to put your questions into the, uh, the Q&A or the, the chat and um, uh, I'll, I'll start off with a question. Um, uh, so uh, this is a, a very interesting system, and I think it's it's exciting to be able to increase the um, the energy density of the uh, the material in the storage tanks uh, by quite a lot. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering though, um, uh, when you um, uh, create the solid, when you when you uh, 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 solidify or, or when you, you uh, crystallize and then you uh, precipitate and then you dissolve. Do you need to do something with the liquid as well? Like, do you need to take out some of the liquid in order to reduce the the, the volume, and then add the add it back in uh, when you're um, uh, when you're uh, uh, dissolving it? Uh, maybe I'm not following your question. Let's say we'll start out with a um, mixture already, with let's say one part liquid and two parts solid. Okay. And we'll just let's say. We start out with a vanadium-4, vanadium-5 system, and we start out with all vanadium-4. Uh, one part uh, of a liquid soluble vanadium-4, two parts of solid vanadium-4 in the storage tank. And we we'll only cycle the soluble liquid form to the flow battery. Okay? And as we consume vanadium-4 plus to make vanadium-5 plus, the concentration of vanadium-4 plus will drop slightly in the tank because it's consumed, then that promotes the dissolution rate. We need them for plus solid will now dissolve to try to maintain the uh, saturated condition for vanadium four plus. Right? And we do that until all vanadium four plus solid is completely consumed. And then at the end of charge, you will end up, uh, depending on the solubility of vanadium five, let's assume it's the same, you end up with one part of all vanadium-5 in liquid, two parts of vanadium-5 in salt. I see, but will the, um, uh, will the uh, 
the concentration of the vanadium four go down in, in the original tank, or will the level just go down at the same concentration? It doesn't change that much, uh, depending on the density of the solid four and solid five uh, structures. I see. OK, OK. All right, well, we have a, a question in the chat. Um, that's, uh, are, are these systems of solid liquid uh, uh, redox flow batteries uh, easier in terms of recycling and safety? I would expect so, right? You, it's easier to, well, have everything in a smaller volume. If you're dealing with uh, the, the totally liquid system, when you recycle, you're talking about a lot of volume to recycle try to pump or truck out uh, that kind of volume, I think will be a lot uh, uh, more troublesome than uh, a dense uh, solid liquid system. I am only guessing now, I'm not a recycling expert, but uh, the, the only thing I'm claiming is that a, a redox flow battery, a recycling of a redox flow battery should be simpler than a system like the lithium ion battery because you got so many elements right, in the solid form in the uh, uh, lithium capital that you have to dissolve and you have to extract them. In a redox flow battery, you deal with mostly maybe one element. And I see. it's a soluble form already. So it's not too hard to recycle. Makes a lot of sense. Great. Uh, well, um, uh, speaking of uh, multiple elements, it's a question. Um, uh, do you think that this uh, concept can work with uh, vanadium bromide salts as well as uh, vanadyl sulfate salts? Uh, does the uh, brom uh, vanadium bromide salts have higher solubility? I think it should work for any salt as long as it has this uh, positive temperature solubility dependence. I see. Like we are okay. using the positive temperature swing, right, to increase the solubility. If you have a, there are salts that uh, has lower solubility at higher temperature. That way, in, in that case, you may have to reverse your temperature swing, but it's not as attractive, right? We like to operate the battery at a higher temperature to get faster kinetics. So you don't want to operate the flow battery at a lower temperature than your storage tank. But so far, from what I've seen, there are a lot of salts that have this uh, positive temperature solubility dependence. Great, great. As I mentioned also that, um, uh, that acids such as uh, hydrochloric or sulfuric acid can increase the, the, the solubility uh, somewhat as well. Is that, that something you considered? Uh, the reason we are forced to use uh, this level of uh, sulfuric uh, acid concentration is because of the nafion proton conducting membrane, right? So the ion conduction through the membrane is through the proton. And if, yeah. if the uh, acid the H plus concentration in the electrolyte is low, too low, lower than the vanadium, then the vanadium cation would displace the H plus cation in a membrane, killing the proton conductivity of the membrane. That's why we need to operate at least at two molar acid concentration, just to maintain high proton conductivity in the membrane. 